when your consciousness ends in one world, it could continue to exist in many other worlds. So really quick, did you each read the books, The Three-Body Problem, before or after you got the roles? And did anything in those books help inspire your characters? Oh, yeah. Before I... Okay. My character, the fans will know, is actually okay. called half from the third book and half from the first book. So I read... I skimmed through those two um, before the show and the time that we had to just at least get a basis of who she was intended to be. And then it was a collaboration with the guys to, to see who she would become. Yeah, Awesome, how about you, Javon? So I didn't, I wasn't familiar with the book until this opportunity came about. Um, I just took it upon myself to, to read the books once I was gonna play the part. Mm -hmm. It was hard to grasp the first time reading it just because the material is so rich and the physics is uh, so complex. But, uh, but I think, again, it was like Jess said, that it was, it was a testament to, to Alex, uh, David and Dan to, uh, to adapt it in a way that everybody can connect to it. A lot of people can connect to it. I think uh, it's a story about people and it's important for you to, to care about the characters before they're presented with this uh, extraordinary circumstance mm -hmm. that we find them in. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's funny, Javon, you've done other apocalyptic type sci-fi shows. I'm thinking The Leftovers, The Stand. What attracts you to like crazy world ending themes? I wish I could tell you, I feel like maybe you know, I, I I bring them to me. I attract them. They don't attract me. You know, um, <laughs> no. I think it's 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 cool to get to do sci-fi because, well, I should I should be more a bit more specific. I enjoy sci-fi or just any genre where it, again it starts with the characters. It's always about the characters. Mm -hmm. I think that before you put them into any type of worldly event or anything like that, the people, the audience has to care about the people that they're watching. Mm. And I think that's what is sort of my guiding light with the characters that I decide to uh, to pursue. Um, and I, I tend to gravitate towards underdogs as well. And that's the reason why I really uh, enjoyed playing Saul, just because he is someone that when the audience meets him, they perhaps won't really think much of just because he's kind of just a guy that's skating by in comparison to his colleagues who are, who are, uh, equally gifted and, and, and far more ambitious. Let's talk about the, the characterizations a little bit. Both Jin and Saul approach life, like you've mentioned, very differently. Um, the Oxford Five, which is sort of created for this series, this sort of group of friends, what are your roles within this group, your characters? What are your characters' roles within that group? Mm. Uh, yeah, the Oxford Five, all uh, kind of geniuses of their generations, but went on different paths. So Jin, is super, super driven. She's very um, focused on achieving her goals and solving all of the problems, no matter what stands in her way. Mm. Um, but I think she's also um, one of the more empathetic of the group and she tends to uh, really relate hard to um, other people and, and try to pull everyone together. Yeah, I like that. I think it's, it's really refreshing because all of those characters have different uh, personalities. Mm. And you can kind of see in the other scenes throughout the episodes how they all interact with each other when they're in pairs yeah. or when they're in groups of three or when it's all five. You kind of you kind of get you can kind of get an idea of how they likely were when they were in uh, at Oxford in school and how yeah, I, I would definitely see Jen as the more uh, uh, genuine and serious of the bunch especially when they're faced with something that's somewhat of a challenge. I think she's the one that's like, come on guys, let's figure this out. Where Saul's like, dude, chill, chill the hell out. It's gonna, the answer's gonna come to us. You just gotta wait. So let's have a drink in the meantime. I think it's, it's refreshing to see that, yes, they are all brilliant minds, but I think they approach big decision things and then the little day-to-day -day stuff very differently. You just mentioned Oxford, and I heard a rumor that the two of you actually went to Oxford to like research the show. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, Perhaps it, to research the show. Well, just yes. It was to get a vibe for <laughs> the characters. I mean, um, for me anyway, it was my first time in the UK. So I wanted to know where these people had met and um, forged their bonds, you know. So yeah. that was Oxford University, which luckily we had a, um, a physicist, Matt Kenzie, on board to advise us. And he introduced us to a couple of his students. A couple of their students that are getting their doctorates now and, 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 and take it, this is their discipline. This is what they do. Mm -hmm. I that wasn't my first time in England. I was born in Oxford, so it was cool to get mm -hmm. to go and and be in that environment. But but we had a good time, and it was it was really cool to kind of really get to see 
what our experience would have been like had we been smart enough to go to Oxford to study <laughs> physics and not become actors. Uh, being in a room, a very small room with all of these equations all over the walls mm -hmm. and uh, knowing that they spend almost all of their time exclusively in these little, uh, what do you call them? Oh, like no. these groups. They're, so it's, it's, it's basically the Oxford Five. We would have all just been in this little class and spent all of our, uh, our education, educational journey yeah. together, mm -hmm. which is why they're still friends when you meet them in the story because they've spent all this time together and mm. you know they know everything about each other. Mm. One of the things that I don't think everybody realizes right away, Jess, is how much time your character spends in this VR universe. In fact, I think from the audience's perspective, you spend the most time there. How does this affect your character? And what can you tease for the fans about this little VR universe? Yeah, you could almost say she's um, addicted to this game because she goes in and she barely worries about eating or sleeping. <laughs> um, but that's just the kind of obsessive personality that she has when it comes to solving a really juicy problem. Uh, I can say that the game will be epic, a visual feast. Um, anyone who's read the books and has imagined that world, your expectations will be blown out of the water, in my opinion. Um, and I can also say that... Uh, it will be wild and fun, but also kind of harrowing what she harrowing what she experiences in there, and that's what draws her in. She's so empathetic that she connects to like characters inside the game or, or the world inside the game, and she feels like she needs to solve their problem. The last question: If you are to get a season two, what is the one thing, without spoiling anything, what is the one thing that you hope your character gets to do? I have an idea of what my character will get to do. I can't say what it is, but I think uh, to try to answer some portion of your question, I would hope audiences understand uh, in life, people are always burdened with making difficult choices. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes you just have to uh, trust your instincts and, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think I answered it, but I tried. <laughs> so that should still be, you know, I get points for that. I think it's widely enough known that there's a time jump in the books. So I hope my character gets to experience the time jump. I'm going to start with you, John. Uh, the showrunners, David Benioff and D.B. Weiss, who you worked with on Game of Thrones, apparently wrote the character of Jack for you. But Jack is very different from Samuel Tarly. <laughs> so uh, my question was, was it like a reunion for you coming back to work with them? And what was it like playing a character so different like Jack? It's it's, it's an interesting one, that, because because... When they pitched the, the character to me, they said, we're going to write you a character that you've never really played anything like this character. And we, it's actually, we think it's closer to your own character than any character you've ever played before. And I, I read an interview with, with Dan Weiss the other day when he said, they realized halfway through filming Game of Thrones that I was diametrically the opposite of the character that I was playing in that show. And then I took that as a compliment because actors always will. And then I thought, hang on, Sam was quite nice though. <laughs> Sam was quite a nice guy, loyal and kind. I don't know what that kind of says about me, but it, it, it did feel like a, a reunion. And I was just so grateful to them that they gave me this part to play because I think it's a part that people, unless they knew me really well, I don't think they'd give me a part like this. They, because, because the character of Sam was so a certain type of character and so identifiable, and I was identified as that character for 10 years. So I think that it, it, only those guys would have written me a character like this. So I'm very grateful that, that they're letting me play different sides of myself that I maybe not have, not have touched upon before. No, that is wonderful. Um, Alex, your character will, uh, actually both of your characters are part of the Oxford Five, which is sort of a crew that was created for the series. What's Will's role within the Oxford Five? Well, the Oxford Five are uh, a group of close friends, um, which have, uh, I mean, they've gone in, in different directions as is such with any group of friends. Um, Will, I don't think, um, had the, the 
drive or perhaps the ambition to sort of pursue a um, uh, a career, an escalating career in in physics. And he's quite, um, I think he's a very beautiful um, character. I was describing him a minute ago as sort of quietly heroic. Um, I think he like loves being a teacher and finds something noble about dedicating something to the future. So as far from my character's point of view, like the Oxford Five is just about the bond of, of friendship and that companion, that, you know, the, the deep connections um, that you have with your, with your closest group of friends. No, absolutely. I think specifically for your character, but I'm also thinking of Jin, but so much of that group is about friendship and the different levels of friendship. And the friendship between Jack and Will is really, really special. Um, how do you think Jack's friendship influences Will's journey in Three Body? I think, I think Jack being such a, being such a confident person and such a forthright person and a person who's quite comfortable with his place in the world. He tries to, he tries to infect Will with a bit of that as well. There's a bit of that, a, a, a bit of that confidence and he gets, he gets frustrated with him when he, when he, when he doesn't have the confidence that he believes Will deserves to have. It's almost as if Jack's Will's champion mm. and Jack sees the worth and he sees the, he sees the sort of, the value in his friend, when, when the last person to ever acknowledge that is Will himself. He's, he, he's kind of a hype man in a way, but he, it goes deeper than that because he knows that he has so many sort of psychological barriers to get through before, before he can really in, in, invest a degree of confidence in this, in this guy that he cares about so much. But yeah, he, 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 he just, he just his, his biggest fan and his biggest champion, I think, but he knows that it's a very, he's got a lot of work on his hands to get through to him. <laughs> and I think a, a, for Will, a world without, without, a friend, without Jack's friendship is a, is a very sort of stark and um, uh, hard, hard existence. I think there's a, a, a sort of healthy genre of codependency. Uh, which comes with any um, beautiful friendship, you know, that you, you lean on each other. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's such a beautiful friendship. And that scene on the bench is, uh, you know, that meant so much to us in episode two, uh, Rose's episode, brilliant writer Rose, uh, which was one of the things when I first read the script, I was so moved by. Yes, they, they definitely have, I think, one of the most uh, important relationships in the series. Uh, now, John, Jack is a lover of nerd culture. And if they wrote this character for you, then that means you are kind of a nerd too. No. <laughs> and he also has a snack empire. Yeah. And so I have questions. <laughs> uh, well, the answer is I'm, I'm in the worst possible position. No, no that, that's, that's the wrong thing to say. I'm not in the worst possible position. The position that I'm in is that I look like a nerd, but I'm not smart enough to be a nerd. <laughs> I'm kind of... I, I present myself physically to the world as a nerd, but I'm too stupid to be one. So I'm kind of, I, I, I kind of have the worst of both worlds in a way. But no, no, they, they, I mean, they famously, the reason that, that way, the reason that Jack Rooney is called Jack Rooney is because I was obsessed with, the, with, a, with a Manchester United footballer called Wayne Rooney. And once we were sat around a table in Northern Ireland talking about what books we were reading. And they were reading various science fiction books and non-fiction books. And I was reading... Wayne Rooney's memoir called My Decade in the Premier League because I only ever read books about football. That's all I, that's all I kind of, at the time, that was all I was really invested in, so. Didn't that win the man Booker or? Uh, came second, I think. Yeah, yeah, but, I was second. But, yeah, but, but, but Jack, Jack's, Jack's, Jack is, in, in, is, is very much into that culture. And then he, he, sells his snack, he, he, you know, developed his snack empire and suddenly has got all the money in the world to spend on his interests. And I think from, for many, for many young people, that's, that's their, their wildest dream come true. I would say as a, as a little like, um, insider piece of information that John Bradley is actually an incredibly cool person behind the scenes. 
Well, no, that's awesome. Also, last question. Uh, you said you're a Manchester <laughs> United fan, yeah. but they made Jack a Manchester City fan. What's up with that? Well, that's just them all over. That's, <laughs> shade, yeah. that's exactly the type of thing that they do. They'd be a bit like, okay, okay, we're gonna we're gonna let let you come into our show. We're gonna give you this great part to play, but we also want you to kind of humiliate yourself in front of all your friends and make go into the next game that you go to really quite uncomfortable for you. That's the kind of trade off. <laughs> Someone or something is targeting scientists. They're going after our best and brightest. There's someone behind everything. You just have to dig. So how would you describe the relationship between Thomas Wade and Dashi? Are they friends? It's a bromance. It's a, it's a That's secret what it bromance. is. Offset. It's, Onset uh, and offset. We can't keep our hands off each other. I tell uh, you, can you not sense it? Stop it. There's stop electricity it. in the room. Stop it. We're just waiting to cut. Yeah. But yet, uh, the, 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 this unlikely duo that have been thrusted upon... Uh, each the, other. Yes, with the job at hand. You know, they are very much chalk and cheese, but they get the job done. They respect each other highly. There is, they're aligned for the greater good. They're highly motivated, these two. They absolutely are. Now, Liam, uh, Sir Davos, the character that you made famous in Game of Thrones, if he ever met Wade, I think Wade would kill him. So how does it feel playing such a ruthless character? You know what, That's an inter it's an interesting proposition. I think if you put the two of them into a room, and Davos, who, you know, for them that don't know, he was regarded as the moral compass, that do the right thing at all times, be careful of people, look after, you know, and, and be sweet, soft, and, and, and caring. Uh, I think Wade would look at him and go, I'm sorry, I don't understand the language you're speaking. Um, it, he's, uh, they're, they, are, they, uh, they are the ultimate chalk and cheese. Um, Wade's a, a monster. He's a... He's a, he's a uh, he's a he's a man that uh, on a mission and and gets things done by as we've seen whatever means necessary and some of those are incredibly questionable. Uh, I know exactly why you're asking the question, <laughs> <laughs> but they um, both they both have their place in society. One might say, yes, they do. Um, Benedict, at one point you had said that that she was an opportunity to play a different version of yourself. Are you moonlighting as a chain smoking detective? Like how did this character <laughs> affect yeah, now, you? Yeah, now I can finally, I feel seen. Um, <laughs> no, it was, uh, you know, uh, when, when I uh, met the guys on Zoom, I was filming Doctor Strange at the time and it's rare to get a chance to play your kind of region, regional accent, you know, where I'm actually from, from the North. And uh, they had wrote this character description where my parents came over from the 70s from Hong Kong and he was raised up in, in, in you know, Manchester. I thought, this sounds awfully lot like me. And they copied the Wikipedia page. And uh, <laughs> uh, so the two, Alex, Alex Wu told me, so uh, uh, what a way to woo me. And, uh, <laughs> and um, you know, it's um, it's it's been, and the same with you as well, yeah. Liam. I think you know. To, yeah, they did the same thing behind yeah. both of their backs yeah. uh, because I think of the book which I haven't read. Uh, he's an American. Uh, the the um, ex is he ex CIA or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Uh, and they they uh, when I, I I said yes, and they rang me up, and I just said uh, yeah, of course I'll do it. I hadn't even read the scripts just because of my history with them, and they're just skills, their talent at storytelling and writing. Uh, and then I read this guy and he's mentioned about being from Dublin and stuff. And both of us had that conversation yeah. about that we've been stripped back and it's kind of close to us or, yeah. or kind of who we are. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a bit like st stripping stuff off. We can't hide behind accents or prosthetics or, or uh, as actors. And you feel, mm. you feel a little bit Vulnerable. Yeah, a bit, vulnerable, <laughs> a bit vulnerable when you're doing it. But it also but frees you in a way it to, does. to have some fun. Absolutely, yeah. Is that vulnerability one of the things that you like most about the world that the showrunners you just mentioned, Benioff and, and Weiss and Wu, have created? Uh, well, I don't think it... I suppose that shows a bit of vulnerability to him. He's, he's, he's a, 
I always found, found that there's, a, there's, a, there's an inherent sadness in him. Uh, well, we're, we're, no, he's, he's, a, he's, he's a, a bull. Um, mm-hmm. uh, um, so it's a, it's vulnerable as, as the actor. I was, I, I was probably just talking about me personally. Being vulnerable. <laughs> anyway, not know about anyone else, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Well, what, um, what do you love about this world that the creators have? You know, let's get away from vulnerability a, a yeah. little bit. We've got, you know, mystery, sci-fi. We've got psychological horror. You know, what? take your pick. What What is the fa- your favorite thing that they've created in this world for you? You've just sold the whole thing for us <laughs> in a beautiful way. It's you a- have this horror. You have this existential threat. You have this human story of these people who we have to employ to help us save humanity and their, and their love lives and where they are in their life, in their young lives. Mm. Uh, and if they don't use their, their incredible talents to help us, uh, save, save our species, save, you know, everybody on this planet. Uh, and is there anybody in more of a difficult situation than those who are left with the responsibility of saving billions and billions of people? Tell me where there's a better drama than that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And your two characters, however, have two di- different visions of the future. Can you elaborate on that? I think we're quite aligned, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. I think we are. We may have yeah. different ways of going about things. Yeah. Uh, I kind of come up with the plans, and, and and I have access to everything, and then I've become the job now. You know, he's so mm. focused on what he does. Mm. He's, uh, he's results orientated. You know, he gets mm. a Scooby snack occasionally <laughs> from Wade. But, you know, <laughs> but that's it. And everything else has fallen uh, uh, on the wayside. You know, family life, everything. It's just like you are what you do. And he is just good at what he does. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's there to help for that greater good. Yeah. Now, all actors tend to create backstories for, you know, their characters, things that are not on the script. Did each of you real quick come up with any little idiosyncrasies that the two of your characters have that we don't see on screen? No, I, I think it just sort of generated naturally, didn't it? You know, when we met, we, we, we hadn't met before, really. No, we certainly hadn't worked before. No. But I think things that built between myself and, and Liam as actors, we're grafters and we just run our lines together mm. and then we find room to laugh and kind of create a, a, something that's relaxed and that, mm. that, that, that we can have an area to, to play, you yeah. know, within our scenes. Point. Yeah, we're brick builders. But then, but then constantly when we're just always just having such a laugh, whatever that is, mm. we've got a lived in experience. And I think with these characters, all, all of a sudden, they're lived in. You, you, you come into the story, you know, the, the ground running, and you just kind of go, these two know each other for a while. We don't know how long, yeah. but we're in it now. And that's yeah, it's, it. I think, I think a lot of that comes with experience. There would be a lot of younger actors who need to hang their hat on a, a backstory. And we do get, you have a big backstory in this, with, mm. you know, with family and the song. Yeah, yeah, all that sort of stuff, it's there. But I, 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 I like the, there's an enigmatic quality to Wade that is, uh, where do they come from? Where do they go? What is this Irishman? It, this weird guy who's got the United Nations Secretary General and uh, complains that he can only, he's been looking for a thousand nuclear weapons, but he can only come up with 300. Uh, and you're just, and you're kind of going, whoa, hold on. What? Who is the, who, who, who's saying yes to this guy? Um, and uh, you don't know who his boss is. You don't know where he came from. Is he the boss of bosses? Who does he answer to? We don't even know the name of the organization. Um, I, I find all that really, really wonderful. I don't mm. need those questions answered. This guy is driven. Uh, he's, he's, not, he's not the result of whatever happened to him in the past. He, he, he lives in the moment. Here's the problem. Go after it. Destroy it. Get it out of the way. And when, Until the next problem comes along. And when you make a call, they answer. And that's it. And there's a level of power that you, you can see, yeah. you know, when that happens. We don't know what they are. Maybe we can't know what they are. The two of you play the same character. And in the past and the present... 
Did you check out each other's performances a lot? And what inspired each of you about the other's interpretation of the character? Oh. I know, okay, so um, prior to my first day, uh, um, Zine had already finished. It was my filming. last day. Her last day mm, was my yes. first day. And we met in Spain, and um, I had already been sent footage from the first episode. And I was floored, basically, as I'm sure everyone who watches it will be. Um, I was floored by her inner strength, that the inner strength that yeah that Zine brought to yeah. I was floored by um, the, her ability to maintain composure in the face of trauma, which is not something that I would be good at. I, I, I think most people would have an inability to encounter the situation that way. And um, yeah, being a scientist is more head initially than heart, I think. And I think Zine was able to bring that initial uh, introduction of yeah to light in a way that I really hadn't perceived before. I really want to believe that Ross did the magic. So I did mine and she did her. And we just meet uh, one time in Spain and we just doing stuff because it's just, uh, we didn't discuss about anything of the character. So she, Zine built the foundation. She set up the foundation so that if there was an earthquake, the house wouldn't fall down. And I just put the pieces together after that, basically. Well, the both of you did phenomenal. Thank um, you. So sweet. Thank you. Zine, you, Zine uh, I believe you've mentioned that you are a fan of the books that inspired the series, Remembrance of Earth Past Trilogy. Yeah. What, Im what impressed you the most about this adaptation? There have been so many, but what impressed you about this adaptation and how the showrunners approached it? They did it so well. The adaptation is faster, more furious, hand in hand, all the big events, how they present the event. Because when I read the book, I had to unwrap it bit by bit with my own imagination. I should say what they brought on the table was beyond my imagination because it's faster and it move forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, if it's okay to spoil, they condense the character's per, uh, purpose. Like, uh, mm -hmm. they, they could put so much work and um, full of juices into one character that probably in the book that you could see uh, three or four characters doing, doing the, uh, the, all the tasks. They but made it universal. Basically, yes, you know, because the book was a little bit more narrow, and you know, of course, it's beautifully written. Um, mm -hmm. But the script took it off the page and really made it visual and made it's it like more appealing to a universal for the audience. Screen. Yeah, it, honestly, there were things that were in the script that looked like it was impossible to recreate, and in the book. And when I saw it, even though I was there for the filming of it and you were there, I literally gasped in certain mm. portions of the book. So they really, of the show, they really did bring it to life in a way that um, it seems impossible when you read the script and when you read the book. And, and, and it was easier. The access was easier than the books. Because got the you, books has you. so many um, physics and science, science. and history particularly at the very beginning, but they adapted so well, so it fit the screens. Amazing. I mean, I'm not a science, I, I'm not a science fiction person at all. Mm -hmm. And this book, real, or this, this show really appealed to me. It, it's like an indie movie, almost inside a detective story inside. It had a little bit of everything. Um, I binged it and I mean, I'm not a binger, so I, I loved it. 
Yes. Well, Rosalind, actually, I, I do want to talk to you a little bit about some of that history that you just both just mentioned that happens at the beginning of the story. Rosalind, you've talked about how you have real life family members that experienced the cultural re revolution that is depicted in Three Body. How did their experience sort of shape your character? What did you pull from some of those real life stories? Well, I mean, I think they, this might be the first time that's been depicted on on screen. I'm not sure, but um, the book definitely uh, brought it to life as well. I think um, that sense of isolation that one feels and the sense of betrayal that one feels is something that I have heard about um, since I was young. Um, my parents are uh, were immigrants. So I only he I heard about it tangentially, mm -hmm. um, but I, I I feel like that informs almost everything that yeah does and ends up doing. Um, I I think it, it, experiencing that kind of trauma changes you as a person. It changes how you adapt to life uh, because Zine played um, yeah with that stoicism, not revealing always her emotions at the time. Whereas I was raised American and I think it and I, bleh, I'm vomiting it all over you. But um, <laughs> the character is the opposite of that because you have to create a veil to survive in that environment. And um, the way Zine played her really did depict that in a way that made help to inform the way I played the character as well. It was hard for me, I have to be honest. <laughs> but you are great. <laughs> but I'm like always wanting to, you know, Derek is, um, was directed the first segment and he, he was very strict with me, like, Rosalind, too much, too much emotion. Nope, your face, your face. Because honestly, uh, it's sometimes I think I'm being stoic and I'm not. Uh, so that was something that was really challenging for me. The <laughs> same happens to me. Yeah. <laughs> You're scared. You're right to be scared. But we have got one shot. And I need your help. So the three of you are no stranger to adapting books to television. Of course, Dave DB, I'm referring to Game of Thrones, and then Alexander, I'm thinking of True Blood. What are the rules for adapting books of this depth to the screen? God, Ooh. I wish there were. were so. Yeah, it'd be so much easier. <laughs> so much easier <laughs> if there were rules. Show me the. Rules. I think the, the, if there's one rule of adapting a book that you love to the screen, it's try to make the movie or show version of it, try to make sure that it makes people feel the way the book made you feel. Everything, ah. everything, everything else comes from that. And sometimes that means a really tight, close adaptation. Sometimes that means a very wild divergence from the book that you're talking about. It really, sometimes it's a little bit of both. Sometimes a book is note for note for these first you know, a couple chapters, and then you have to go invent something completely new to get to another part of the book that you want to sing note for note. Uh, and there, there really, there is no rule because every book is different and the approach to every book needs to be different. Gotcha. And <laughs> David TV, was it easier because these books are finished? The story is done? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I think we both fell in love with these books in part. We finished them. Um, within minutes of each other and and the ending is so phenomenal that that once you have all you've read all three books so even in the very beginning there are things that you can set up we don't know if we're going to get to the end of the series it really depends on the audience like if an audience likes the show and if we get a big enough audience and all the rest but if we were lucky enough to get to the very end um knowing where we're heading to and you know knowing that there are certain things we could set up in the first season certain visuals even uh, knowing who the characters would be that that uh, you know we we get to the end with, it definitely is a uh, 
yeah, it's useful. Yes, it's, it gives you a sense of like how to shape things from, from the get-go. Let's talk about the Oxford Five for a minute. Um, they are original to the Netflix series, but they're sort of an amalgamation of several characters from the books. What made you three decide to tell the story this way? That was a, a very early choice that we all agreed upon, and we hadn't been working together very long uh, at the time, but th this is something we hit on together uh, at once. Uh, the Having the combined uh, years that we had spent, uh, you know, telling story arcs that were several seasons long, we understood that the heart of any of, of any television show that really gets under your skin, um, at least the ones we like, you know, uh, are the characters. You know, those are the things that uh, there's that that propel you from uh, one episode to the next and one season to the next. And before you know it, you you know, you feel like these people are part of your lives, have been part of your lives for, for a decade or, or so. And uh, regardless of the genre, you know, it, it, it's the characters that 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 are at the at the heart of it, and that's not exactly the case in the novels. The novels are written more like a history, and uh, and you have uh, individuals who pop up and then go away, and then new individuals pop up and they go away, and they don't really know each other. They don't cross paths, even though they exist contemporaneously. And we thought if we're going to have a show that people are going to care about and really want to follow and go on a journey with, we're going to need to start with the characters. And those characters uh, should know each other and they should have a history together and they should have uh, a past together and they should have opinions about one another. And that's what led to the uh, the, the formation of uh, of the Oxford Five. You know, uh, they all, uh, you know, they all needed to have some some knowledge of science, so uh, so we, we we made them all uh, uh, physics uh, students together. Um, but you know, with that core group, they you know we just pulled characters who were from books two and three into uh, in, into season one, so that uh, you didn't have the odd television experience of going two or three seasons in and being told, "Hey, here's the new lead of your show." That would be sort of an odd way of uh, of, of going about things. Uh, it just seemed to make sense to us. No, it, it absolutely does. Um, also, some of the most powerful scenes with characters in the show took place early on during like the 1960s reenactment of the Cultural Revolution. We spoke to Rosalind Chow earlier. She said that there were family members that she was able to speak to to sort of, sort of glean what it was like. Did you have survivors that you spoke to? What did you, what went into making those scenes feel so real and authentic? Uh, well, my mother, for one, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, I mean, I'd always jokingly said that, like, if we ever needed a backup to play, yay, my mother <laughs> could do it easily, because she wow. would have, she would have totally pushed that button. <laughs> um, you know, uh, in, in, in all seriousness, the, the, our director, Derek Tsang, you know, was the, the one who really uh, uh, crafted that sequence, and he went to really painstaking lengths to make the because it's not something that's been filmed very often you know as you might as you can <laughs> understand yeah. uh it hasn't been shown on screen and 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 certainly to him uh uh it was crucial for it to be shown uh in in all of its truth and and brutality for it quite frankly um you know, it's something that was that happened in my family, but being Chinese American, you know, I'm a little farther uh, removed from it. But uh, I showed that sequence to my mother uh, to see what you know, see what she thought, and she watched it, and she, and uh, you know, she, a sort of a chill came over her, and she said, "That's that's that's real. That's that's really what happened." And then she said. Why would you show someone this? Oh. <laughs> why, do you, why, why would you want, to show, want anyone to see this? Yeah, uh, but the, I think that was a sign that we'd gotten it right. Yeah. You know, because uh, she she had uh, lived through it, and uh, and she was about that age. She was the age that Ye was uh, when when it all happened. And then your daughter reacted to it very strongly. I also showed my daughter, who was three years old at the time, and that is that is much more an indictment <laughs> of my of my lack of, uh, of of skills as a parent than it is. Uh, I just wanted to see whether she would she would like catch on to the narrative, not being able to read. You know, she doesn't understand Chinese, and she doesn't, and she can't read the subtitles. Would she get it? And she very much did. <laughs> 